We're in the Gospel of Mark. If you'd like to turn in your Bibles there or navigate on your device, Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, that's going to be our text. Mark 2, verses 1 through 12, the topic. Four godly friends of a paralytic man are undeterred by the crowds. They improvise a unique way of carrying him to Jesus for healing. The title of our message, Carry On, My Godward Friends. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for giving us uh, this opportunity to come, to fellowship with each other, to worship together, lift up our voices and our hearts in praise before your throne. And now, Lord, to look at your word and have it look at us, to study your word and have it study us. I pray that the Holy Spirit would be our teacher, that he would be here, not just in our hearts, but in our midst, and that he would take this word and make it powerful and alive in our hearing. We pray these things in Jesus' name, and those who agreed said, amen. Bill and Maya Donnelly woke up to a loud crashing sound at their Arizona home in the border town of Nogales. Thinking the boom was thunder from a lingering rainstorm, they just went back to sleep. Imagine their shock later that morning when they discovered a large plastic package in the destroyed remains of their German shepherd's doghouse. It was a 23-pound parcel that police say contained about $10,000 worth of marijuana. The illegal drugs had likely fallen from a smuggler's aircraft that had taken off from Mexico, officials said. A different sort of package came through the roof of Peter's humble home to rest gently at the feet of Jesus. Too bad this wasn't captured on video. It would certainly have gone viral. The clickbait would have read something like, four friends carry paralytic to see Jesus. You won't believe what happens next. Do you ever, do you ever fall for those? Yeah, they're, and it's called clickbait because they want you to click on it and then they've got you. The camera and they're looking at you and they're at home right now looking at everything you're doing. No, I'm just kidding. A little bit conspiratorial there. But uh, anyway, yeah, there, there's, you know, click here and watch to the very end. Yeah, just forget all that. Quit sending that stuff. What happened next, though, blew the minds of everyone present. Jesus healed the paralytic, of course, but not before announcing that the man's sins were forgiven. I'm going to organize my thoughts around two questions. Do you think it easy for Jesus to forgive sins? And number two, do you think it easy for Jesus to heal sickness? Let's take a look, first of all, at the forgiveness of sins in verses 1 through 5. I know it's not easy being green. You recognize that as the melancholy musings of Kermit the Frog, or maybe you don't. It must have been too hard to be green because Kermit has gone blue, as in off-color humor. I read that the recently rebooted Muppet show on TV is full of family unfriendly sexual innuendos and situations. Remember when you used to be able to watch TV and think it was okay? Yeah, that was like maybe never, but um, not so anymore. So watch out for the Muppets. The modern Muppets are, they have an agenda. They're trying to get your children. I'm kind of serious. Uh, <laughs> Is it easy to forgive sins? It is if you are God. Otherwise, it's not just hard. It's impossible. And so let's pick up the story in verse 1. And again, he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. This might be the origin of that expression, in the house, that's thrown around so much today. Uh, word spread rapidly that Jesus had returned, and people sought him out. Are you a person others might seek out in their time of spiritual need? I know that you want to be. So if the Lord is showing you anything that needs to change, then let him change you. Just be open to what the Lord might speak to you about uh, your life and, and making yourself more available to others. If you're a Christian, if you know the Lord, you know enough to tell a non-Christian how to get saved. And you probably can offer some comfort and encouragement to Christians as well. Verse 2. Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door, and he preached the word to them. In the Jewish culture of the first century, when hospitality was huge, people just popped in any time without any invitation. Imagine having several hundred, maybe a thousand people show up at your door and just be crowding around wanting to come in and individually meet with or at least listen to Jesus. It says he preached the word to them. You might be aware that Pope Francis was in the United States visiting. 
There's a soundbite circulating on Facebook. It's a portion of a Sunday sermon by Pastor Jack Hibbs from Calvary Chapel of Chino Hills. He summarizes that the Pope addressed some 1.2 billion people. When you consider uh, the media that was at his uh, command. But not once in any of his speeches did he ever preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not once did he let the world know that unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Not once. Imagine what the Apostle Paul would have done with that kind of an audience. Paul wanted to go back into crowded auditoriums filled with people who wanted to kill him so that he could preach the gospel of Jesus Christ one last time. Uh, a, a billion people having the opportunity to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, and instead, that opportunity never happened. Verse 3, then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. Now, this man had somehow lost the power of his bodily movement. He could not, on his own, hope to get to Jesus. He becomes a picture for us, a type of the sinner. We are born dead in trespasses and sins. As Pastor Don McClure is fond of saying, we are physically alive, soulishly active, but spiritually dead. We cannot on our own get to Jesus. We must be carried there somehow. We are carried there th by the cross on which Jesus died. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, speaking of the cross, I can draw all men to myself. It affords God's grace the opportunity to affect our hearts. God's grace enables us by freeing our will. And when our will is freed, we can either accept God's saving grace by faith or we can resist it and reject salvation. Verse 4, and when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. There was no handicap ramp or special paralytic entrance into Peter's house. Four guys carrying a paralytic on his own bed were not going to be able to squeeze through the crowd and get in front of Jesus. There were just too many people. And thinking about this, apparently the crowd wasn't parting for them. Here they were, four guys carrying a man in grave need, and yet the crowd, you know, you know how you do sometimes when you're at Disneyland? You kind of, you know, push in. This is what happens anytime you're watching the fireworks at Disneyland. You've been standing right here for seven hours to watch the fireworks, that, because it's a great show. And then 10 minutes before it starts, three million people crowd around you, and they're all taller than you with beehive haircuts. And so it's just crazy. And so this crowd had no sympathy, no compassion for this man in his grave need. They didn't look and say, oh, look at that, those four friends, how they must love him. Let's make a way for him. Hey, every man and woman for himself, this is Jesus we're talking about. And so they couldn't get through. And you know what? The crowd always wants to block your path to Jesus Christ, whether it's a real crowd that you hang with or whether it's just the world making uh, its blockade in front of you, always hammering you with carnality and things like that. Th there is a, a, a definite strategy to keep you from getting to Jesus Christ to keep you from the Lord and for the world. Now, the houses in Capernaum had flat earthen roofs, tiles laid over support rafters, then packed with mud. It wouldn't meet code today, but it was sufficient back then. Since these one-story roofs served as patios, most houses, houses had an outdoor stairway that would lead to the roof. And so just picture it. Jesus is in the house, thronged with people. Suddenly, debris starts falling into the room from the roof until a man is let down, probably by four ropes tied to the corners of his mattress right in front of the Lord. And so each one of them has got a corner. A little bit more on yours, you know, a little to the right, you know. And they let him down. The Lord must have been so excited. Imagine, I mean, just imagine if you're Jesus and this is going on, and you're thinking, man, Peter is going to be bummed. <laughs> but check this out. I mean, this is real faith. 
And so it says in verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you. This man was carried along to Jesus when he could do nothing for himself. Jesus commends his faith and the faith of his friends. God uses means to carry us to Jesus. His word, anointed by his spirit, taught and shared by men and women, carries us to the Lord. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, throughout this chapter, mention is made of Jesus seeing the thoughts and the motives of hearts. When he said, your sins are forgiven you, he was responding to the thoughts and motives of this man's heart. I believe this man came to Jesus by faith, seeking the forgiveness of sins and not just a physical healing. Where is that in the text? Well, first of all, it's implied in the verb tense, which is, your sins are right here, right now, being forgiven. Jesus wasn't saying that, hey, when I die on the cross, I will forgive sins, and if you believe that, you can be saved later on. Jesus said, no, your sins are forgiven right now. And that tells me that he was seeking forgiveness because uh, forgiveness of sin is never automatic. It's not unconditional. Jesus is the Savior of all men, but not everyone is forgiven. Only those who come to Jesus by faith, believing God to save them. And so for Jesus to say to him, son, your sins right now are forgiven, is a response to him seeking that forgiveness. This word forgive obviously means to wipe the slate clean, to pardon, to cancel a debt. When we wrong someone, we seek their forgiveness in order for the relationship to be restored. Forgiveness is not granted because a person deserves to be forgiven. No one ever deserves to be forgiven. The need for forgiveness implies there was an offense, a genuine offense against another person. Forgiveness becomes an act of love and mercy and grace. It's a decision to not hold something against another person despite what they have done to you. And so let me reiterate what I said earlier. We are spiritual paralytics incapable of getting to Jesus. God must take the initiative, and he has. He sent Jesus, who came of his own volition, to die on the cross, to pay our debt of sin in full, and thereby offer us forgiveness. God's grace issues from the cross where Jesus is lifted up, drawing all men to himself. And when you believe that Jesus is your Savior that your sins are forgiven because of him, then he exchanges his righteousness for your sin and you are saved. And so, yes, it is easy for Jesus to forgive sins. It was costly, but it's easy because he is the unique God-man. So let's look at verses 6 through 12 and ask the question, do you think it's easy for Jesus to heal sickness? I think we'd answer yes to this as well. Jesus went around healing sickness and delivering from demons. He is no less able today, seated in heaven, to do those same things. What bothers us is that he definitely does not do it as often as he seemingly did it in the first century. Now, we're going to disagree probably on why. I'll talk about that at the end of our message. But I think an honest assessment of the situation, you'd have to say, Jesus is just not healing as many people in our midst as he did in the first century. And those of you who are sick here this morning, those of you who have, uh, so in some cases, life-threatening illnesses or chronic illnesses, you're a testimony to that. I think you believe that if Jesus were, if you were in the first century at Peter's house and you got to Jesus, you would have been healed. Uh, but for some reason, you're not being healed today. We'll talk about that. And we'll find some encouragement in these verses. But let's look at what happened first. Verse 6, some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? There were two main sects or groups among the Jews, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Pharisees generally were considered the more spiritual by uh, the average Jew. They believed in supernatural things, things like angels and the resurrection from the dead. Sadducees were more liberal. They denied the supernatural, and especially they denied resurrection from the dead. They also were more sympathetic to Greek culture, more willing to compromise with it and to adopt its customs. They tended to be wealthier, and they had more political clout. 
And so those were the two kinds of groups uh, of Jews. There were also others like the Essene community, which was an ascetic community out in the desert. Those are, that's where they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so there were other things going on. But basically, you're either a Pharisee or a Sadducee. And both of those had their scribes. Scribes were serious scholars of the Jewish scriptures. They were the intellectuals of their day. These guys were scribes of the Pharisees, and they reasoned like this. Only God can forgive sins. This man claims to forgive sins. Therefore, he blasphemes being a mere man. As we know, the proper reasoning goes like this. Only God can forgive sins. This man claims to forgive sins. Therefore, Jesus must be God and man. Josh McDowell, when I was first saved, I read a bunch of Josh McDowell books, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, still a classic. And he used to say, Jesus is either a liar, a lunatic, or he is the Lord. Uh, there is no other alternative. So a lot of times people will say, you might even talk to me and say, well, I think Jesus was a great man, a great teacher, kind of like a Gandhi or a Mother Teresa, um, great philosopher. We should, you know, live by the words of Jesus, all of that kind of stuff. We don't have that uh, uh, freedom because Jesus said to this man, your sins are forgiven, which is something only God can do. So if Jesus isn't God, then he's either a liar or he's a lunatic who thought he was God. And so why would you listen to the words of a lunatic? Oh, yeah, he claimed to be God and all this other stuff. But man, this Sermon on the Mount stuff is really rich. It doesn't work that way. It's all or nothing. And of course, we know that he is the Lord. And he's going to demonstrate to these guys that he is the Lord. Verse 8, immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, why do you reason about these things? in your hearts. In his spirit means in his human spirit. It wasn't because he was God that he perceived this. Jesus was fully God. He never ceased to be God, but he did willfully lay aside the prerogatives of his deity while he was on the earth. He lived as a spirit-filled, spirit-led man. Jesus is an example to us of what it means to be a man. Spirit-filled and Spirit-led. He was fully God, but he didn't go around acting like God. And so when these situations happened, it wasn't that Jesus was reading everybody's minds because he was God or that he always knew what he was going to do next because he was God. He was functioning as a Spirit-filled, Spirit-led man, and he perceived this in his spirit. Most likely, this is what we would call a word of knowledge where the Holy Spirit spoke to Jesus' spirit something he could not otherwise have known. That's what a word of knowledge is. It's when suddenly you know something about a situation or a person that you couldn't otherwise know. And so the Holy Spirit said, hey, these guys are reasoning that you're blaspheming God. And so Jesus busts them out and he says, why, why do you reason that in your heart? I'm sure at least one of them said, I'm not saying that. Uh -huh. uh, I was thinking about uh, dinner. Yeah, that's it. He's thinking about what I'm eating for dinner. And so Jesus is busting these guys with the help of the Holy Spirit. Verse 9, which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise, take up your bed, and walk? Now, they're both pretty hard, things that I couldn't say and they couldn't say. But the scribes were denying Jesus' authority to forgive sins, thinking he was a mere man. And so he was going to show them he was not a mere man, and in the very next verse, he's going to call himself the Son of Man, which is very significant. Son of Man is Jesus' favorite title for himself. Most scholars trace it back to the book of Daniel, where the promised Messiah of Israel is called the Son of Man. The scribes knew from reading their scriptures that when the Messiah came, he would perform an incredible amount of miraculous works, like healing paralytics. Jesus was letting them in on the fact that their promised Messiah, the Son of Man, was not a mere man, but he was God come in human flesh. And so in verse 10, he says, that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He turns and he says to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Everything rested on this. Either the paralytic would be healed and Jesus demonstrated to be the Messiah, 
or the man would remain paralyzed and Jesus' ministry would end right there in his being stoned to death for blasphemy or at least deserving a stoning. This is one of those moments, I think, when it got extremely quiet. Very serious moment. What's going to happen? There's a miniature altar call in Jesus' words to the paralytic. It's really fascinating. Uh, and I like to point this out because maybe you don't know this, but there are groups that ridicule the modern altar call. They say there's nothing like it in the scripture. And, you know, the idea of preaching the gospel and then encouraging people to stand up and come forward and pray to receive Christ. You say that's, that's an invention of, of human beings, that we shouldn't do that uh, and all. Well, there's a lot of things that we could say, but I want to show you this miniature altar call that Jesus gives. First of all, he says, I say to you. He's talking to the crowd. Well, he's talking to the scribes with the crowd listening. And then he turns to this one person. He says, I say to you. This is going to be him speaking directly and personally to him about his sin and the forgiveness of his sin that was only possible at the cross. If you came to Jesus later in life, there was a moment like this when you had to make a decision. Maybe you were in a church service. Maybe you were at a crusade. The Lord was speaking directly and personally to you about your sin and the forgiveness of your sin that was only possible at the cross. There might have been 50,000 people in the stadium, but you were sure that you were the only one because the Holy Spirit had your attention. I say to you, I ask you, I speak to you. Arise. That's a command that required the paralytic to exercise faith. His faith would be shown by his believing he could do what he was told to do by Jesus. Do you realize, do you realize the, 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 telling a paralytic person to arise? That person is going to have to believe that it is possible. Jesus didn't say, I say to you, levitate. I'm going to do it all. He said, no, I say to you, arise. Right now, believe that I've forgiven your sins and you have the power to get up. I don't want to compare your getting up out of your seat at a crusade and coming forward to the healing of a paralyzed man, but there is a similarity. Will sin keep you paralyzed in your seat, or will you receive spiritual healing and signify it by getting up and coming forward and receiving the Lord? Some of you would have that testimony that you were in many situations where you, you were just about to get up, and then that opportunity passed. That's why evangelists so often give multiple altar calls. They'll say, you know, get up from your seat, and then the band's going to play. <laughs> Let's do that again. I'm talking to you. Get up from your seat. <laughs> and it goes on and on. And then finally at the end, people get up, and they come forward because they're, they're paralyzed. They know they should get up. They want to get up, but they don't. They're hoping there's a, a warfare going on. They're hoping the moment will pass. But the Lord ministers to them, and they get up out of their seat. Take up your bed. That's a demand for prompt obedience, proving your love for the Lord. I mean, why take up his bed? He could just as easily have left it there. But a disciple does as he or she is told, and so it's a point of obedience. And once you're saved, the Lord has good works for you to discover and accomplish by his now indwelling spirit and by the baptism of the Holy Spirit coming upon you. Whatever he asks of you, he has enabled you to do. The paralytic could now take up his bed, something he couldn't do before. And you and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And then he says, go to your house. That meant he would remain in Capernaum. He would be a living testimony to Jesus Christ's authority to forgive sins. Maybe his neighbors weren't there that day. And, and they were going to get up the next morning. And while they were out getting the paper or whatever you do in Capernaum first thing in the morning, they're going to look over and they're saying, who are you? I'm the paralytic that lives in this house. What? I thought you were paralyzed, and you were visited by four friends all the time bringing you food. Yeah, I met Jesus, and he was able to give his testimony. And after you are saved, you generally return to your life, but now you've got a testimony to give. You were once paralyzed, but now you can walk in new life in the power of the resurrection. You're a new creation in Jesus Christ. And so this is a house altar call, essentially. Jesus says, I'm talking to you, get up, go forward, give a testimony. And so when people tell you there's no altar calls, there are. And even so, 
what's the problem with asking people to give a testimony of their faith by getting up? What does it hurt? How many millions and millions of people have expressed salvation in that way? So uh, it's so easy to be critical. Uh, it's almost like we make it hard for people to get saved, you know, because of our small-mindedness. And so verse 12, immediately he arose, he took up the bed, and he went out in the presence of them all so that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. We need to realize how miraculous these miracles were. I'm no doctor, but I'm guessing that this man's muscles had atrophied. He probably didn't weigh very much, and he generally looked wasted. Immediately, he was on his feet with restored muscle tone, perfect balance, and at a reasonable weight. His four friends didn't have to help him up. He didn't have to prop himself up against them. They didn't have him one uh, by shoulders or anything like that. He stood up. It might have even been hard to recognize him one moment after this pronouncement. Think of the lepers Jesus healed as a more extreme example of what I'm saying. They would be greatly deformed in face as well as in body. Full-blown leprosy leaves a person looking grotesque, barely human. It's not just a skin rash. I mean, if you've got full-blown leprosy, you're, you're wasted. You're grotesque. A healed leper would be totally changed in appearance immediately. People probably wouldn't even recognize him as the same person. When you got saved, weren't you somewhat unrecognizable too? I think many of us have the testimony that our friends and family could instantly tell that there was something different about us. You, uh, you probably talked differently. I remember one guy who got saved here at our fellowship years ago. He called me the next day, the day after he gave his life to Jesus, and he said, guess what I didn't do today? I don't know, what didn't you do? He goes, I didn't cuss once all day. And he realized it wasn't because he tried. He didn't put a lock on his mouth. He just got to the end of his day and realized that he, he wasn't swearing anymore. He wasn't using cuss words. I said to him, you must not have talked very much today then. <laughs> I knew him. Your personal vices probably changed. Maybe your entertainment choices. Not because someone gave you a list of do's and don'ts, but because God the Holy Spirit who was now in you was communicating to your newly born again spirit what is pleasing to God. I've counseled at crusades before, uh, Harvest Crusades and different events that we've put on, you know, at, at different Calvary chapels. And um, after we minister to people and give them, you know, tell them what they should be doing, we don't give them a list of do's and now, now don't cuss and get rid of all your Metallica albums and, you know, <laughs> don't watch uh, ABC, don't watch The Muppet Show, you know, that kind of, we did, you don't do that because the Holy Spirit does that. Their life just changes because now he is dwelling within them, and they, they all of a sudden realize, wow, I don't, I'm not cussing anymore. I'm not drinking anymore. I'm not doing some of the things I used to do before that were vices and that, you know, and all of that kind of a thing. If nothing else, there was a joy in your life that you never had before. It was the joy of the Lord in his salvation. The Bible describes it as a joy unspeakable and full of glory. Then it says he went out in the presence of them all. There were hundreds, if not thousands, of people in that crowd. It was a crowd that had not let the paralytic through. It is a crowd that had hindered him, but it says now he went through them all. He took his time wandering serpentine through them all so all could wonder at his physical and spiritual healing. Can you imagine the conversations? Uh, excuse me, I'm just leaving. Pardon me. Remember me? Four guys were carrying me on my bed, this bed that I'm now carrying, and hey, you wouldn't let me through. But praise the Lord, I don't care because it was all to his glory, and now I'm healed. What a testimony. Uh, busted. You wouldn't let me through, and now I'm healed anyway. What's the matter with you? It, it's pretty cool. They were all amazed and glorified God. A better translation is they were amazed and glorified God. The crowd was amazed, not the scribes. The Messiah they constructed from their studies was not compatible with the man claiming to be him, and so they rejected him. Imagine that. The smartest guys in the room 
who had studied the Scriptures their entire lives, scribes of the Pharisees who expected the Messiah and believed in the miraculous, and were seeing the evidence that this man, Jesus, was their Messiah, ah, you're not him. We don't recognize you. It prompted me to think, do we have our own version of Jesus that is not who he really is? On a very basic level, I'd have to say yes. Uh, this isn't that important, but as, as a proof, I would say let's take Hollywood as an example. Most of the great Jesuses on film have been British. You ever notice that? I remember when we first got saved, the big news in town was Jesus of Nazareth, the, the uh, miniseries. And we were, uh, some churches were canceling their Sunday night service or breaking early so we could get home and watch Jesus of Nazareth. And I enjoyed it, don't get me wrong. But Jesus was a British guy with blue eyes who never blinks, by the way, once. <laughs> no, this is true. I know you think I make things up, but in order to make him seem ethereal, He's never seen blinking. And he looks weird. I'm going to practice that during my sermons. <laughs> See how freaky it is? Hey, I, I, I wanted to go to Calvary Chapel, but that pastor never blinks. <laughs> and so uh, then the more recent series, the Bible, uh, same thing. Jesus is certainly not Jewish, not in those. In a credible source, what did Jesus look like? Justin Taylor wrote, I'm laughing, but this is serious. Pam told me not to share this, but here we go. <laughs> From an analysis of skeletal remains, archaeologists have firmly established the average build of a Jewish male at the time of Jesus was five foot one inches tall with an average weight of 110 pounds. The average Roman soldier, the average, was five foot six. That means there were a lot of short soldiers. <laughs> Russell Crowe, by uh, way of uh, comparison, who played in Gladiator, six feet tall. So he could have been a full foot taller than the average one. But you and I, I guess, don't want to go see movies with five feet tall people in them, I suppose. <laughs> so you short people, you rejoice this morning. This is for you. You could look Jesus in the eye when he was on the earth because he, and so, you know, we just, this is, now this might be a little bit silly, but we do misportray the Lord when we do that. When we think of Jesus as a six foot two muscular carpenter with blonde hair and blue eyes, he didn't look like that. The Bible says, in fact, that he, there was nothing about him that we would notice. He was average. He looked like all the other Jews. You want to know who's five feet tall? Danny DeVito. <laughs> you know who's five foot six? The other top end? Dustin Hoffman. And so those are the guys that should be playing Jesus in these specials, but I don't think anybody would watch. Instead, we have these really chiseled British guys because there's something about a British accent, isn't there, that makes you think, wow, that's, you know, uh, because they all spoke in King James, you know, back in Jesus' day. <laughs> now, a far greater significance is how we portray the character of Jesus Christ. I would guess that we would generally prefer the righteously indignant table turner over Jesus to the turn the other cheek Jesus. I don't know how many times as a Christian I've either thought or heard somebody say, well, Jesus did turn over the money changers' tables. <laughs> okay, yeah, he did. But he did a lot of other things, too, that are, are and so, you know, we, we can't always want Jesus to, to be turning people's tables over for us. Sometimes we are called upon uh, to walk in meekness. And so let's be scribes who see Jesus as he is actually portrayed on the pages of the Bible and try as much as is humanly possible to overcome our biases. Let's see the Jesus style of ministry in the first century and then translate it for our own day and age. And this is hard. It starts with agreeing that you do have biases. I have biases. I read the scriptures. I read everything a certain way. 
whether it's by nature or nurture. And, and, and we need to really be able to step back and think, okay, what is really being said? What does that really look like? Kind of like this morning. What did this really look like for a five foot three inch Jesus to be doing these things, not a six foot tall Jesus? And then we kind of break down those barriers and, and see how Jesus really ministered to people. And it's a, uh, it's a powerful thing. Now let's talk about sickness because that's the elephant in the room. We feel as though if we had been alive when Jesus was on the earth, we'd have been immediately healed. Almost everyone was. Not everyone. But so many people were healed or delivered from demons that John, at the end of his gospel, said that if they all were recorded, the world could not contain the books that would need to be written. Now that Jesus is in heaven, you'd think healings would be easier and more abundant. Yet, as I pointed out, there are many sick even among us and certainly fewer healings in our midst. And so what gives? And Christians argue uh, about why that is. Generally, they say it's because uh, we don't have enough faith, and if we had more faith, and you know, if we weren't so conservative, if we were more charismatic or something like that, we would see Jesus do more healings. I think we need to understand that there was a greater emphasis on physical healing when Jesus was here offering the kingdom of God. As I already mentioned, healing and deliverance from demons were going to be the signs the Messiah would perform as his credentials. And so it goes without saying, if the Lord says, hey, when the Messiah comes, there's going to be miracles like crazy, that before he came and after he came, there aren't miracles like crazy. There are miracles in the Old Testament. There are miracles today, but not to the extent as there were when Jesus was on the earth. When John the Baptist sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the Messiah? Jesus answered saying, go back and report to John what you have seen and what you have heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. I'm doing those works in abundance. Jesus still heals. We believe in the miraculous. If you are sick, we pray you will be healed, that your cancer will be gone, that your tumor will disappear at your next doctor visit. But we recognize that we live in a different time. The poster boy for the church age in which we live, I would say, is the Apostle Paul. Ask anybody who is the greatest example of a Christian, and almost always they say, well, there's probably some obscure person we've never heard of, but if you're talking about the Bible, it's Paul. Paul gifted to heal others on certain occasions, but at the very beginning of his walk with the Lord, when God was saying, Paul, this is what the Christian life is going to be like, he didn't say, these are how many people you will heal. He said, this is how much suffering you will have. He gave this record of his sufferings in 2 Corinthians. Paul says, I have far more extensive and abundant labors with far more imprisonments. I was beaten with countless stripes and frequently at the point of death. Five times I received from the hands of the Jews 40 lashes but one. Three times I've been beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I've been aboard a ship wrecked at sea. A whole night and day I have spent adrift on the deep. Many times on journeys exposed to perils from rivers, perils from bandits, perils from my own nation, perils from the Gentiles, perils in the city, perils in the desert places, perils in the sea, perils from those posing as believers. I've been in toil and hardship, watching often through sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, frequently driven to fasting by want, in cold and exposure and lack of clothing. On top of all that, Paul said, and lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. If you think that's just for Paul, Paul turns to us and makes these promises in the book of Romans. He says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, famine or nakedness or peril or sword? It is written, For your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Dorothy said to Toto 
I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> well, believer, I have a feeling we're not in the first century anymore. Signs and wonders still follow the preaching and teaching of God's Word. The gifts of the Holy Spirit, all of them, are still available to the church today. It's not from a lack of faith or unbelief or conservative teaching that most people go without healing. It isn't because we now have the completed Bible making the miraculous somehow unnecessary. It's because we live in a unique church age between Jesus Christ's two comings to establish the kingdom of God on the earth. And that age has its own characteristics that we just read about. In the meantime, his strength is being made perfect in our weakness. The Bible doesn't say his strength is made perfect in our healing. We can be healed. We sometimes are healed. But it says generally it's going to be made perfect in our weakness. It's a period of time when God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. It's through our weakness that God is shown strong. It's contrary to our thinking. We don't like to accept that, but that's what the Lord says. Healing is easy. Counting it all joy when we fall into various trials, thinking it not strange when a fiery trial comes along, that requires faith, and that builds faith. You're familiar with the expression, through the roof. It means something that has increased dramatically. Sales at In-N-Out have gone through the roof ever since they came here to Hanford because I'm there almost every day. <laughs> the four friends of the paralytic and the man himself, if, if you'll excuse me, had through the roof faith. Their faith went through the roof, literally and spiritually. Like, we're not going to stop until we get to Jesus. If you want through the roof faith today, it comes mostly through patiently enduring trouble and suffering, not from avoiding it or from being healed from it. Patient endurance, looking for and hoping for the coming of the Lord. Oh,